So there's a lot less light loss, right? So in, in a LCD, you're going backlight through a liquid crystal, through a color filter, and then you get the light. So you, you lose a lot of the light. And there's, by the way, a polarizer, so you're losing through five stacks of film. In OLED, especially the emissive one, you actually eliminate the, well, the polarizer's still there, but you, you eliminate the RGB and you eliminate the liquid crystal, so you're gonna get all the light out. So it, it looks way better, way, way better. So you, you can see, you'll see it. I mean, if you see his phone versus your, just put it next, you, you'll see the difference. <laughs> and it black is black, right? Contrast. It's like black minus, yeah, exactly. It isn't, you know, yeah. So your, um, you know, uh, it, it, it just looks, I don't know, I can't show it. It just looks, looks way, way better. But, so let me, yeah. And the viewing angle. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> well, but for the mo, you know, but for mobile, I th actually think OLED has got to be way for the TVs is another thing, but for the mobile, because you, know, you can also say what's the content you're consuming on the TV? Are you in video mode? Are you in static mode on the TV? You're on video mode, so then you know the LED. But in in your, I don't know. So, um, it's the same as amorphous looking. The same as LCD. Yeah, so in LCD, you have a backlight, okay? In the white OLED, your light is not a backlight, it's a white OLED. So the light's being, well, no, because this is still emissive. So you're, as opposed to this light is always on. Yeah. So they, you, don't, you don't necessarily pulse this light, you, it's just, on, and then this is actually only when you want to write to that pixel. Does that make sense? No? It's similar in terms of, okay, uh, where's your board? Okay, here. Okay, this is backlight, it has to be on. Oh, terrible penmanship, sorry. Liquid crystal, and then this is moving to get you the light, and then this is RGB. So first problem, you're gonna lose light through this liquid crystal, correct? So now you're eliminating this stack, and all you have is a white OLED. So your transistor is changing this, and then this light is always on. Here, if you want to write the pixel, then you turn this device on, right, this diode on, into that R pixel, or that G color filter pixel, or that V color filter pixel. And then, you know, the color filters, um, side is actually controlling the RGB. So you're eliminating this, this light loss through the, through the LCD. Make sense? Agree with me, Anish? Agree. Some sort of correction? And it's off, right. I mean, the point is, this has to be on. So if you wanted this to be black, you're just, the liquid, this is staying on, this is just changing so the light is scattering and it's not going through. Is that? Make sense? So that's, that, that's why you, you're going to have a lot more light efficiency usage here. It's only on when, when you want to write the pixel. Okay, so back to patterning. So the way you pattern now, okay, they're lines, right? Ooh, good luck raising hand. So, right, this whole 1080p lines, you're patterning red line. This is really what's happening, green, blue, right? You're putting down the material, red, green, blue. The way they do it now is there's a mask. It's like, I don't know, I always think about these things like, really, that's, that's not very clever, but that's just the way they do it. It's, it's a mask, it has holes in it. Evaporate the material, it goes through the mask where it's not shaded, the red goes. Seems like really silly waste of material, right? Because you're evaporating and it's only going through, so you're losing lots of the material. So what are the better ways to do this? So the one I'm talking about is a fine metal mask. That is exactly how Samsung makes their Galaxy S telephones now. And they can get to 300 DPI resolution, right, in production. Really, really hard to scale this mask up to very, very large 
OLED TV size. So SMD, which one is this? Yeah, this is, oh, it's also a mask, different kind of mask, not a fine metal mask, but a small mask. And again, you're evaporating the material, but to this point, and then it goes in. But they're both masks. Um, there's a new one that we're talking about, or that we've seen, which is called laser-induced thermal imaging, LITI. And the way that works is there's a donor film. Let's say you have a donor film. You deposit the material that you want, let's say red, okay? And then you laser down this material and it falls onto the substrate. And that's uh, LITI. Okay, and then the last one is a company we've invested in called Kativa, which actually is in Menlo Park, um, MIT uh, startup. CEO's name is Connor Madigan. And they are actually trying to use inkjet printers. So it makes a lot more sense. You actually have to fill these. You just make a, like a regular printer and print the lines red, green, blue. Oh, Eileen, that should work perfectly. Well, yeah, maybe. The problem is, is that um, these are displays, so it's unforgiving. If this is thicker or thinner on the edge versus the middle, you're going to see it. So you have to make sure your uniformity, so the more of the display is going to be bad, but you're uniform. Um, in fact, they try to use inkjet printers and color filter, but you just can't get the uniformity and your eye can see that it's not working. So the good news is for OLED, it's a little bit easier than inkjet to color filter, so hopefully Kativa will be successful um, in doing their inkjet solution. And then the white OLED is, you know, you don't have to pattern the RGB. You still have to put down the, the um, materials, though, the, the layers, the transport and injection layers. Um, okay? Okay, so we talked about the laptop is the first wave. The monitor is a second wave. The large screen LCD is a third wave. Then the fourth wave being smartphones and tablets. And the fifth wave, hopefully, if they actually get the price down to less than one and a half thousand dollars, being OLED and 4K, 2K, UD type televisions. Now, um, I've forgotten your name now. I said I was going to remember. What? <laughs> okay, okay. So next generation deploys. You're asking me, gosh, Eileen, what would you actually invest in? So we have invested in general in companies that are already, let's say, out of the technical. I mean, they're, they have a little more technical risk, but they at least have a prototype. So we haven't done the, you know, have a concept. So the two investments we've made, they were able to show us a display of a certain size working, and we were able to test it, and it had some good features. Their biggest problem, and this is, this is where Applied really can help. So let's say you've done one, so you went from this small to, to this big, and now you need to go from a Gen 2 size fab to a Gen 6 size fab, and you need to scale up. You need to choose your equipment, the process, what's going to get you the most yield. That's what Applied is really, really good at. So the best thing for us to do is usually to invest in companies in the display area that already have a working prototype. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so we'll need you a little, little venture capital kind of background. All right, so. Does anybody know what IRR is? I know this is a double E class. You know what IRR is, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Does anybody? Okay. So if you make a, if you're an um, a investor and you seed a company with a one million dollars in revenue or one million dollars in investment, how much do you hope to get out if you're at seed stage? Maybe 20, right? 20 mil. So that would be that materials company that you're talking about. Okay. If you are a Series A, 1 million, you're 12, right? Yeah. 15, 16, 6, 
series B. C, and it's three to five, and then D, it's, we'll say one to three, okay? So, now what's happening though to the risk of your company as you're going through these series? Hopefully it's going down, if not, then you won't have any problem, but risk is going down. So, back to the market risk, what you're talking about. Let's say I want to make a million dollar investment in this company. It's a $20 billion market if it were, if it happens. So I just have to prove to myself that they're this little company. And so let well, that's true. So let's say I'm doing a one million, I'm gonna make this real simple. One million to get twenty percent of the company. So if I if I pay one million to get twenty percent of the company, what is the valuation of the company? Post money. Oh, good. You know, double E's usually ca can't do uh, arithmetic, <laughs> I mean, including myself. They can't balance a balance sheet. They can do differential equations, but they can't balance a balance sheet. But anyway, <laughs> so five million. So if I want to make 20x, what does this have to be worth? 100. Okay. If I tell you a display materials company has to um, trades at, let's say, I don't know, I'll make up a number, 3x revenues. What's the revenues of this has to be, company has to have? 33. Okay. Do I think that this company has a chance to get make 33 million out of this 20 billion market? Probably, if they're good. So this is worth it. So the pre-money matters, how much cash? Now, here's the problem. What if I told you, oh, I lean, actually this, these, these bright young Stanford PhDs actually think that it's, they're, after this million, they're gonna have to raise another 500 million. Now I got a problem. So if they're gonna raise 500 million, their valuation may be 1 billion, right? So, because they're only gonna give away half of the company. So 1 billion, and I have to make 10X, mm. they have to be worth 10 billion. If they have to be worth 10 billion, they have to sell 3 billion. They're a small company, that's a real tough feat. Maybe, you know, better yet, you hope that they create a 20 billion market and ride it, but those are real, real tough. So. How are we making decisions? We're making decisions based on, you know, what are the risk adjusted probabilities of getting a certain revenue multiple to justify the return on the investment given the risk. So that's how we're judging it. And that's the same way you judge, you know, when you're, when you're doing an acquisition, you're also looking at if I pay this, what is my payback period? So IRRs, um, you can like, there's time frames to this as well, right? This is 20 million in seven to 10 years. This is, you know, five to seven, three to five, one to two. So if you're doing these 1x, 2x, 3x, it's essentially IRRs of between 27 and 37% IRR. Does anybody know what the stock market gives you? Like seven, six, seven, right? Or maybe less. So you're talking about a beta, you know, a very, very high beta on these, so, okay. This one's a little bit harder, but um, this is an investee company. It was incubated inside of Philips, and then Philips spun out a lot of its projects in, back in 2000, and this was one of them. There were like 20 startup companies that came out of Philips. Um, so has anybody heard of Electro Wedding? Yeah, how come you've heard of Electro Wedding? Oh, excellent, good. So you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so this is a spin out of 2006. It's based in Eindhoven near, near um, Philips and uh, they were planning to sell IP license and consulting. So what did they do? Okay, this is actually pretty cool. Okay. So you take morphous silicon backplane, same as LCD, yeah? That's what's driving your device. Grow proprietary hydrophobic layer using standard semi-processes. So it's actually a photoresist type of material that you grow and then pack to make what are looking like little egg crate type things. And I'll tell you why you do that in a second. Okay. Then, 
you deposit your own oil and water mixture. So with a million dollars, I'm pretty sure if you're a material scientist sitting in this lab in Stanford, you can probably come up with a material that can work on a hydrophobic layer. That's, you know, not a lot of capital equipment. Then, you're actually driving the voltage to move this. So, now what have you just done? If you think about this, you've eliminated the liquid crystal. The liquid crystal itself has become the thing that causes the color. So this is both a shutter and the thing that causes the color, because if you make this RGB and it's sh shifting on and off, then that's a color. So the other thing is that because it's um, hydrophobic and there's some electrostatic and surface tension, you can make this, is that right? Mm, I'm showing the wrong one. In this case, it's not bistable, but there are ways you can make this bistable. So I was looking at one company that has a, a way of using this to make it bistable, so you're now like e-ink. So e-ink, as you know, is bistable. You just do the voltage, turn it off, it sticks. Here you actually have to keep the voltage on. So that's the bad case because it's still like LCD, but in the good case, it's much less power and you're losing less light because that's the shutter um, and you're not going through the LCD and the color filter. Right? So let's talk about what that does for you. All right? You're still going to get high resolution because you can, this is still using standard display processes. So you can get the transistors down to certain pixel size. You can still get color, whereas the Kindle, the Kindle is black and white, and the way they get color now is they actually put a color filter on top of it. So they're losing, the way a, a Kindle works, as you know, it's reflective. So the light hits the front plane, and then you see the image. So the way they have to do color is they have to put a color filter, so the light's going to hit the color filter, then their front plane, then go back to the color filter, and you lose it. So you're losing light twice, um, whereas here you're not. This is just coming off. But here's some of the... Uh, I thought this was good because this is a very topical. Those are some of the prototypes. Um, so why we invested is we went over to their labs back in 2009, and we put my Kindle at the time next to their prototype, and they pressed play, and they did video. And then it was the first time back then you could actually see a Kindle type of device doing video that wasn't, I mean, Kindle Fire is using LCD. But um, that's why we made the investment. The other thing is that because you can make this polymer layer with and the, the hydrophobic polymer layer, you can actually make it on plastic. That's not so easy with liquid crystals. So they were actually also trying to do flexible types of um, electrolyte displays. So um, that's one of our investments. Okay. This is the latest one. This is, this is an investment we just made in January. Um, let's see. This company makes multi-stable liquid crystal. So now the liquid crystal here is actually bistable. So unlike the liquid crystal in your LCDs, which are not bistable, so you always have to keep power on it so that it keeps its state here, it is. Now, again, back to your question of, how do they do that? It's a material science um, uh, invention. So they figured out how to make their liquid crystals multi-stable. And that's, that's the invention. And again, they did it with less than a million. Now they have a lot of help from the China government, but it's, it, it, it was actually, the guy was a PhD in Cambridge, and he was working on this in his PhD. And he went back to China, and someone from England contacted him and said, I'd like you to make me ESLs with this technology, and he did. And that's how he raised his first money. So it can be done. Um, and then we came in later. Now, again, Suzhou in China gives their startups really nice kind of manufacturing facilities and lots and lots of support. So he's benefiting from that, being an expat. But... Um, Still, you know, the invention was done during his PhD. Um, okay, now why did we do it? So we make uh, IT, do you know what ITO is? You know ITO? No? So we make equipment that deposits ITO. So this company actually, the ITO 
the surface morphology of the IPO matters for this company. So that's where the strategic investment comes in for making that decision for us. Okay. So how is it working? Light comes through, just like liquid crystal. It's got a certain homeotropic alignment. Um, when you, when you uh, put voltage to it, if you put a different kind of voltage, then actually the light scatters and you don't see it. Both cases are mechanically stable, hence why they are bistable. So you do not have to, you can just switch it and it stays in that state. So you don't have to continuously pulse the liquid crystal. Now, what are they doing with it? Um, they have their own proprietary liquid crystal formulation that they've done there. They are selling about a million dollars worth of electronic shelf labels today into the Walmarts of China, um, which is a really great, uh, great market for them. But we actually um, invested in them because they're an. Does anybody know what el electrochromic glass is? Yes. Okay. So, how much do you think electrochromic glass is today? Yeah. Does anybody have any electrochromic? Oh yeah, maybe you do. Is it electrochromic? Some cars do, right? Mm. So it's like eighty bucks a meter. I mean, meter squared. It's very, very expensive. It's as complicated as making a battery if you think about it. There's so many. I don't know, cathode layer. And although it blocks heat, the other reason why you want it is it also is good for privacy. And what this can do is, is a really, really cheap way of getting making privacy glass because the material, the liquid crystal material that they make is really cheap. So the other place they're going after is electrochromic application, types of applications. So they can't, so electrochromic is, is modulating the IR the heat and the light, visible light, okay? They're not gonna be able to modulate the heat, the IR, the solar radiation, but they can modulate the visible light. So you could come up with a hybrid solution where you put low E on top of, anybody know what I mean by low E? Yes, okay. Low E and then you can modulate the visible light using this technology and it's really, really cheap. So if you're gonna get, you know, what we talked about in the very beginning, if you want mass adoption, something has to be cheap. So um, that's the other reason why we invest in this company. So here's some of the films. Um, it's mostly on glass today, but again, you can put this liquid crystal on flex. And we thought that you could use this technology for Kindles, for smart glass, for digital signage, and even all the way up to LCD. But you know, s those two markets, back to this calculation I did before, how much money they're raising, how much revenue could they get, can I get a certain return and can I sell tools into this market? That's why we invested. That's it. So let me just end with